Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about a fantastic plane, a plane that served in at least three major wars and many smaller ones and conflicts, a plane that could do a multitude of things, and a plane that was outright rejected by the first pilots to receive them, who would plainly state after receiving and testing them, quote, we do not want the plane under any circumstances as a replacement for anything. Incredibly harsh words for a plane that was not only viewed initially in testing and design as being fantastic, but fantastic by those who would later fly it in a multitude of conflicts. That's going to be a key thing to think about here. What was up with this plane that made those pilots hate it, but made everybody else love it? This is probably one of the longest lasting planes built and flown and that served in World War II. This is the Douglas A-26 Invader. Its story starts in late 1940, before America would join the war, with Douglas aircraft responding to a call from the Air Corps for a new attack aircraft design that could do basically anything they wanted it to. From light bombing to medium bombing to ground attacking and anything in between, it was essentially to be a high-performance multi-role attacker. Lined up for this role, sort of, already was another aircraft from Douglas, the A-20 Havoc, first flown under this designation in January 1939 and officially introduced in January 1941. The A-20 would be a quiet staple to Allied forces across the globe during the war, with over 7,000 made and flying in Britain, Russia, Australia, the Pacific, Europe, and the Mediterranean. But in late 1940, before the A-20 could be adopted by America and have a pretty solid career, Douglas was already looking at a potential replacement. Kind of important to note as well is that a technical predecessor, but really just about the same thing, to the A-20, called the DB-7, had been flown a year earlier than the A-20 was, and was present in Europe in very small numbers before Germany would attack France and Britain. In these early excursions with the A-20 predecessor, it was noted that the defensive armament was a bit lacking, ammo was low, and that the speed would definitely need to be increased in the future. With just a single rear-facing defensive gun, at least on that angle, they weren't wrong. And this is something that would be remedied on the A-20 proper. But while improvements were made to the early A-20s, work on its replacement would begin. Key to improving performance would be an upgrade in the engine, and luckily for Douglas Aircraft, the perfect engine had flown for the first time just a few months prior. In May 1940, the Pratt & Whitney R2800 Double Wasp had taken to the air, and that engine would see a total production run over 100,000 over the course of its career, and it would be used on fantastic planes like the F6F Hellcat, P-47 Thunderbolt, and F-4U Corsair. A fantastic high-power engine was now ripe for the plucking. This new engine would immediately increase the total horsepower of whatever the new design would be by at least 25%. The A-20 would use the Wright R-2600, and that had around 1,600 horsepower. The R-2800 would have at least 2,000 horsepower. And because Douglas was already working on the A-20, they wouldn't exactly have to brainstorm terribly much for a new design. And generally speaking, the silhouette of their new design would largely mimic what the A-20 looked like, just scaled up a bit. Measuring in at 15 meters long, 21 meters wide, and 5.64 meters tall, the new design basically just looked like a slightly larger A-20. Different from the A-20, though, would be a few key things. For one, it would have a newly designed wing that would ideally reduce drag. This new wing was a laminar flow airfoil wing, where the flow of air over the wing is supposed to be far smoother, thus reducing drag. Ideally, this new wing design would help increase performance 
and just reduce inherent drag that is present on aircraft. Or two, it would have a greater defensive armament, with two twin 50 caliber remote controlled turrets in the dorsal and ventral positions. And for three, it would have greater modability, specifically in its nose section. When Douglas made their initial designs, they didn't just make one, they actually made three, with each nose-plane combo having a different initial designation. The first one, the XA-26, would have a glass nose for improved downward vision for bombing. The second one, the XA-26A, would have a radar in the nose, intended to serve as a night fighter. The third one, the XA-26B, would have a quote-unquote solid nose that would house guns. The guns fitted in the nose would conceptually vary from several 50 caliber machine guns to a single 75 millimeter cannon and anything in between. In this sense, the XA-26B would be like several more variants in one, with larger caliber noses serving more as tank destroyers or something, and the smaller calibers serving as, like, support attackers. All three designations would be ordered for prototype production, and by July 10th, 1942, the first one, the XA-26, was ready to take to the air. The first test flight of this plane went incredibly well, with the test pilot landing and reportedly exclaiming that the plane was ready for mass production right now just as it is very high praise. Of course, that wouldn't actually happen, as there was more testing and whatnot to be done, but the flying performance of the XA-26 was reportedly fantastic, displaying excellent handling and maneuverability, despite weighing about 22,000 pounds empty, and its speed would hit somewhere around 360 miles an hour at altitude. Its performance in the air was fantastic for a plane its size, but there were still some issues that needed ironing out. The landing gear was a bit weak and needed to be improved. This problem would continue into the actual production versions. And it was also requested that the engine nacelles be altered a little bit to make them easier to perform maintenance on. As they were, it took two people to perform routine maintenance on a single engine. So they wanted this reduced to just one person per engine. Ultimately, though, after the flight testing of just the first model, mind you, the effective winner of the three was the XA-26B. Now, they didn't exactly proclaim it to be the winner, but after this first flight, an order for 500 models with the 75mm cannon was placed, and there was also an initial order of 200 of the glass nose dedicated bomber model. But that order was then cancelled and replaced with 200 models with 650 caliber machine guns in the nose. In effect, the bomber variant and night fighter variants lost to the attack model. This was despite the fact that the XA-26A and XA-26B hadn't actually flown yet, but I assumed that they were confident after the XA-26 flew and just assumed that the other models would work just as well. The U.S. military seemed to be going all-in on this attack variant, with it having both forward-firing capabilities and also having a bomb capacity that would sit upwards of 6,000 pounds. However, in the coming few years, the U.S. military would seem to chill on the whole 75mm cannon idea, while work was still ongoing with the 75mm cannon nose, the military requested that work be done on some extra guns and the old glass bomber nose. To supplement the 75mm cannon, there was to be additional gun pods under wing and under bomb bay, holding either 50 caliber machine guns or 37mm cannons, along with up to 8 50 caliber machine guns in the wings. Additionally, the glass nose was to continue research and production with two 50 caliber guns mounted on it as well. The solid nose with cannons was to then be designated the A-26B, and the glass nose bomber variant was the A-26C. The night fighter variant was kind of just left behind for now. The first 500 models would be the B, 
and past that for every B made, eight C's would be made as well. After testing on a solid nose with 37mm cannons was done, it appears as though the 75mm cannon idea would be quietly dropped in favor of the smaller calibers. The 37mm nose and a 50 caliber solid nose would continue on, and the first four production models, all A26Bs, would be shipped over to the 5th Air Force in the Pacific sometime between late 1943 and early 1944. These ones fitted with six 50 caliber machine guns in the nose to be tested by pilots currently operating A-20s and the B-25 Mitchell. Here, the A-26 would be able to show off its impressive performance and pretty impressive total armament of 12 plus total forward firing guns, not including those gun pods, and four defensive guns to the rear. At least that was probably the idea. In reality, when the 5th Air Force flew the A-26s in mid 1944, they really didn't like them. In fact, they actually kind of hated them. Again, going back to the beginning, after the 5th Air Force would fly their four A-26s in combat trials, General George Kenny, leader of the 5th Air Force and the Far Eastern Air Force, would message back very bluntly, we do not want the A-26 under any circumstances as a replacement for anything. In that same message, Kenny also said that the A-26s they had were grounded, and their engines were pickled, which basically means that they were taken out of the planes and kept in oil to preserve them. So, as of now, we have two very clear, distinct opinions of the A-26, a test pilot that absolutely adored it, and the 5th Air Force that absolutely hated it, and preferred their old A-20s and B-25s. What exactly happened here? Did something change in the meantime? Why was there such a difference in opinion? From a technical or mechanical perspective, there really wasn't anything wrong with the A-26. The performance that was seen from the test pilot was still there. It still had great speed, handling, and maneuverability. It seems like the key problem was that the perspectives of the test pilot and the airmen of the 5th were drastically different. The test pilot who offered such praise of the plane was more experienced with racing aircraft, which above all else prioritized speed and control. Most other things were secondary. For a pilot using the A-26 as an actual combat aircraft, as a bomber or ground attacker, they would need things like reliability, armaments, visibility, and overall ease of use of the weapons. The problem with the initial A-26s was that the pilot and or those using the forward armament had very poor vision to their front, sides, below, and above. On the early cockpit design, the canopy was heavily framed, with smaller plexiglass window panels broken up by the frame, and the cockpit sat just about flush with the fuselage. While this would probably give the windows a bit more strength, and the cockpit just a bit more armor, the frame sections would obstruct the pilot's view, and he had basically no vision above him. And with the nose jutting forward rather far, and the engine nacelles sticking out in front pretty far as well, vision to his front and sides were obstructed as well. Having such limited vision was kind of okay for a racing aircraft, it wasn't that necessary all things considered, but for a ground attacker and bomber, it was horrible. It's no wonder that the 5th Air Force preferred the older A-20 and B-25, at least you could properly see out of them. However, because the A-26 was, in its specifications, the better aircraft, the U.S. military pushed forward with it, and Douglas, for their part, put forward an interim solution until a more permanent solution was designed. To increase their vision in the short term, the pilot's window would be altered a bit. The roof over his head was just cut out, and a single piece of curved plexiglass would form the window to his side, and a new window above him. Basically, the pilot got a nice new sunroof. 
While this change did improve the pilot's vision a bit, it still didn't fix the issue of poor vision to his front or sides. To fix this, in September 1944, Douglas would have a new canopy designed and ready to test, where the vision-obstructing frame was just about done away with and replaced almost entirely with just plexiglass. Also, the canopy and cockpit was raised slightly, going from being flush with the fuselage to just above it. This gave the pilot much better vision all around, above the engine nacelles, above the nose, really wherever. So, while the initial field tests with the 5th Air Force weren't great, in September 1944 as well, 18 A-26s were sent over to Europe to be used by the 9th Air Force. Presumably, the temporary canopy fix was done to these, but not the new fully glass canopy. After a handful of missions and them suffering no losses, the 9th would report back that they actually quite liked the A-26, praising its potential as a medium bomber and praising its performance overall. They did also note the very poor vision from the cockpit, but praised the solid vision from the glass nose model specifically. So, with the 9th Air Force actually liking the A-26, the A-26 would see much more use over in Europe in the closing stages of the war than over in the Pacific, where the A-20 was still the more preferred plane. In Europe, the A-26 would display remarkable durability, weather resistance, and defensive combat ability. In one case, in late 1944, with a bomber unit flying A-26s with some other bombers like the A-20, because of very poor weather, all individual units and planes were forced to return because of the weather. All units except those using the A-26, which was able to, for lack of a better word, weather the weather. This is just one example, but it is apparently representative of the general reliability and stability of the A-26. In another case, on March 9th, 1945, reportedly a group of 30 German BF-109s would attack a group of A-26s. Now, did the A-26s have escorts? I'm not actually sure, but if they didn't, in most cases, that would be very troubling for the bombers. Still, in this attack, three A-26s would be shot down, but they would also report eight kills of their own in return. Regardless of what their actual kill count there was, losing just three planes to 30 attacking BF-109s is pretty solid, in my estimation anyway. When all was said and done in Europe, the A-26 from around October 1944 to May 1945 flew a combined 11,567 sorties, suffering 67 losses, achieving 7 confirmed kills, and dropping 18,000 tons of bombs. During the course of the war, while I couldn't find exact production numbers for those made just during the war, I do think it's safe to estimate that at least 2,300 were made, with a total production, including any post-war production, going upwards of 2,500. Not all of these would be delivered or flown in combat, mind you, but they would be made. The total production run was just a portion of what was actually ordered, though. In late April 1945, 7,700 A-26s were under contract to be made, with around 1,500 of them already delivered. As the European theater came to an end, and the Pacific Theater, hopefully, was winding down, in May, around 5,000 of these frames were cancelled. With the war ending, they wouldn't really be necessary now. So the roughly 2,300 made during the war would basically be just about all of that were made. Plus, with jet aircraft on the horizon, how long would this piston-engine light-to-medium bomber actually last? It turns out, a pretty long time. Just a few years after not seeing much action in World War II, the A-26, now designated the B-26 after aircraft designations were changed in 1948, it would be an incredibly prominent aircraft in the Korean War, largely serving as a bomber and night bomber. 
Just three units would field the B-26, but each of these units would fly thousands to tens of thousands of sorties, each over the roughly three-year war. Over the entire course of the war, 154 B-26s were lost, so about 6% of the roughly 2,500 planes available. And in return, they would destroy almost 40,000 vehicles, 400 locomotives, almost 4,000 rail cars, and seven planes that were still on the ground, which probably isn't worth mentioning, all things considered. Still, the B-26 was basically the bane of enemy logistics. Allegedly, as well, the B-26 would also fly the last bombing mission during the war, attacking just 24 minutes before the war ended. For the next roughly two decades, the B-26 would effectively serve both as an export aircraft to various allies and as a covert attacker under the control of none other than the CIA. How devious. For the less interesting of these two, the B-26 would be used by the French in the First Indochina War, basically a predecessor to Vietnam. Portugal would also use it to try and hold on to their colonial possessions, and also Colombia would use it. For the far more interesting part, the B-26 would see action under the CIA in Indonesia, Cuba, the Congo, Laos, and Vietnam, before America officially entered the Vietnam War. In Indonesia, as part of America's global war against the threat of communism in the Cold War, in 1949, a war of independence was fought against the Dutch and was won. But the problem for the American government was that this new government, if not outright communist, was communist-leaning or sympathetic. Admittedly, I can't say I know much about 40s and 50s Indonesia, but their president did attempt to create a new political system that included communism, so that was certainly enough to draw the ire of America in this time period. Because of the Indonesian president now, the CIA organized a small group, just a handful, of B-26s that would support rebels seeking to topple the government. However, after one of the B-26s was shot down with a CIA pilot inside, in May 1958, the jig was up and CIA involvement was revealed, which ruined the covert support plan and led to the CIA withdrawing their support for the rebels. Seemingly not deterred, though, the CIA would commission the B-26 again, this time to be used in one of the most infamous U.S. military failures ever, in the Bay of Pigs invasion, taking 17 unmarked B-26s and flying them near Cuba to bases where Cuban exiles were being trained to fight the Cuban military, the B-26s would take to the air and attack Cuban air bases and support ship landings in the Bay of Pigs. With the failure of the mission, some eight or nine B-26s were lost, and the remaining planes were flown back to Nicaragua, where American forces just abandoned them, leaving them to Nicaragua to do whatever they wanted with them. They would keep some of the planes and return the rest to the United States. Then there was over in Southeast Asia, where the B-26 would participate in Laos in the Laotian Civil War. America would, of course, back the monarchy, and they would be going up against the communist forces backed by the Soviets and North Vietnam. Their role here would be incredibly limited, borderline non-existent, actually. There were plans to participate in direct attacks, but these never actually came to fruition. Flying out of neighboring Thailand, a couple B-26s flew recon missions, but after the American ambassador of Thailand learned what the CIA was doing here, presumably to try and stop some kind of international issue, he requested that they knock it off, and they did. And as for Vietnam, the B-26, along with the T-28 Trojan and C-47 Skytrain, were all selected for use in Operation Farmgate, where the U.S. would basically be participating in the Vietnam War before they said they were. A number of each plane were flown to South Vietnam in 1961 to take part in the training of South Vietnamese airmen. 
and each plane would be done up in Vietnamese markings to hide American involvement. These planes would be piloted by Americans, but at least one Vietnamese crew member was required to be on board for any flight to provide some kind of plausible deniability that America wasn't flying the planes, but rather just helping the South Vietnamese learn how to use them. In this very limited role, the B-26 alongside the other aircraft were used for recon and general air support roles, and by the time the operation ended in 1963, four B-26s were lost. The B-26 would later see use in Vietnam again when America was officially in the war up until 1969, albeit in a very, very limited role. And lastly, for the Congo, America supported the central Congolese government in 1964, so when rebel forces took a city and took Americans hostage, four B-26s, flown by the Cuban exile pilots from earlier, were commissioned to aid in the destruction of the rebel forces and the freeing of the hostages. The hostages were freed later in 1964, and the four B-26s would continue to play a role in the central government retaking control of the Congo, and they would be in this conflict until around 1966, almost 1967, before the planes were then returned to America. After this and their limited role in Vietnam, the B-26 would largely be removed from service, outside of some minor exports. After participation in three major wars, and many smaller ones, the B-26, or A-26 if you prefer, was finally done. Ultimately, I do think that the A-26 may be one of the more underappreciated aircraft from the World War II era, probably because it had a limited role in that war, and mainly served in Korea, the far less popular war. Its relative lack of public fanfare shouldn't detract from the fact that the A-26 was actually a really, really good plane. Fast for its size, maneuverable, versatile. I mean, other than the initial canopy issues, there wasn't much of a flaw to it. The invader brought great value to the battlefield, but more importantly, it did invade something else. And that is my heart. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. The reason why I like the A-26 story is the contradiction of the test pilot and the 5th Air Force. One loved it and the other hated it. Just such a dichotomy of opinion that surely confused Douglas and the U.S. military. They'd be like, what happened? I, th I thought it was perfect. Did the first guy lie? He didn't, of course. He just wasn't trying to actually use the plane as a military aircraft. Key difference there. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!